Ready to go? All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, standing by while we figure out how to get the projector to work. Um, HDMI is a, is a process. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, building a, a culture of security in your organization. And so, you know, if you've ever gone through one of these trainings, and I, I saw there are a few of you who've worked in a healthcare setting before, what does that look like? You go into a portal, right, you type in your credentials, uh, IAM team just provision them all your credentials for you, and they say you need to do your HIPAA training, you need to do your security training, and then you go through about three hours nonstop where your supervisor says you need to finish this within 48 hours or you're in violation of your contract. And so you're speeding through and it's slides that are packed with so much information, none of it makes sense. They're talking, you've never done anything technical before in your life, or maybe you have, but you've never really, you know, got, got your feet wet with security, and they're talking about encrypting things at rest and in transit and do this and don't do that. By the time you're done with the first section, they've told you not to do so many things. They've told you to do so many other things. You're starting to get them confused. What should I do? What should I not do? And what, what ends up happening? Well, you start making mistakes and you have no idea what's going on, and you haven't really learned anything. And so most programs are just doing the thing, you know, <clears throat> having a program up and saying this person completed it, it was signed at this time, at this date, it, it was com these modules were completed, they're in accordance with HIPAA or whatever, um, and they're good to go you're now a fully qualified security professional. And it just doesn't work like that. And so um, today I'm just gonna be talking about how, how can you make it more meaningful? Um, how can you increase the impact of your, uh, of your awareness program? And how, how can you get people really caring about um, actually keeping things secure and doing the right thing? A little bit about me. Um, I've worked primarily in um, the, with startups and small companies for the better part of the past 10 years. Um, my focus has always been on healthcare, but I've, I've sort of been all over. Um, uh, from the security end, I care a lot about um, EHR security. I've worked on a lot of uh, data platforms, um, da data registries, so orthopedic data registries, uh, cardio data registries, um, insurance data registries. Um, it did a lot. It, it ha if you've gone to your doctor recently, you've probably seen that they have a web portal. You log in, you see all your test results and all that. And so I work a lot on those too. Work a little bit with medical devices and all that. Um, from the compliance end, I, I work across the entire <clears throat> spectrum of healthcare compliance. And so it's not just HIPAA. If any of you have been involved with uh, SMS, um, especially in the use of, in the healthcare use case, you have TCPA, which is like the HIPAA of um, SMS. Um, and then I also go into um, insurance quality programs. And so, if any of you uh, work in that realm, I'm talking like MIPS, um, dealing with APMs, BCPI Advanced. Um, if that means anything to you, I, I'm sort of in that world. I'm on those calls with CMS. Uh, do a little bit ISO standards with medical devices, so 13485, if any of you have worked with that before. Currently uh, heading uh, security and compliance at a company called Co-Technology. Uh, we collect patient data and then do analytics against it, um, and we help submit for a bunch of these quality programs from insurance companies and all that. Uh, before that, I worked at a, a U.S startup that was part, a branch of an international company. We did a lot of um, IoT stuff, and so I worked a lot on um, the hardware security and compliance of it, and so if you've ever worked with hardware before, um, think working with wireless carriers, getting FCC certified, uh, PTCRB certification, uh, the whole lot, and then obviously ISO behind the manufacturing end. I actually started off my security uh, career in uh, McDonald's when I was really young. Uh, my older brother, uh, he, he told me about how the power grid was vulnerable and that the attackers are coming and that we should all be concerned. And so this was, you know, I'm probably in the first grade when this is happening. And so I go to McDonald's and I want to be cool and there's this girl I really have a crush on and I want to be impressive. And so, you know, here's first grade me and I start telling her about attacks against the power grid. Um, and so I got interested in that way. 
Um, and uh, you'd be happy to know that Andrea, my brother who told me about these power grid issues when he was in the third or fourth grade, um, is now doing network security. And so uh, it worked out for everyone. Uh, just like probably many of you uh, started off playing around with uh, web apps and game security back in 2004. Uh, this is when I finally got 56K uh, dial up, if any of you remember that. There's that transition from like uh, 36 or whatever it was to 56 and I'm like, I can finally go on and do stuff now, yeah. Um, and then ADSL happened um, and beyond just you know splitting my ADSL lines, uh, I could now actually load web pages and you know uh, look at requests and do things over the network without being charged 500 euros a month, which was really nice. So thanks ADSL and thank you uh, Punkbuster for making it uh, really easy if any of you are gamers and have played around with that. Thank you PHP my admin um, for uh, all the fun times and I don't know if anyone remembers PHP Nuke. Um, it uh, was the PHP or the CMS for pretty much everyone. So brief agenda, gonna talk a little bit about the risks that we actually face today as just sort of an average company that isn't you know, a Fortune 500 or Fortune you know, 50. Uh, building a security culture, how do you do it, what does that mean? Um, you know, and we talk a lot about empowerment. Uh, more often than not, it's a buzzword. How do you make it not a buzzword? Um, I'll talk about business buy-in. And so I exist sort of uh, between the uh, developers and just regular people and the exec or the C-suite. And so I spend a lot of time in this realm and this is something we don't often talk about is if you wanna get a program approved, how do you do it? And then I'll talk about the Google Docs phishing incident. How many of you remember that? I think it was May 2017. How many of you were affected by it? Okay, only one, so that's good. That's good, it was pretty bad. Modern risks and threats, so what, what, let's create a baseline and talk about what, what are things that are actually impacting us causing data breaches. Um, probably the best place to look in general um, is the Verizon DBIR, the Data Breach Investigation Report. Um, and in the executive summary, there, there is a really great quote that uh, uh, stuck out to me. Um, and, and I really take this to heart whenever I'm approaching security. And it says, ignore the stereotype of sophisticated cyber criminals targeting billion dollar businesses. Most attacks are opportunistic and target not the wealthy or famous, but the unprepared. And so whether you're Salesforce, Microsoft, Amazon, co-technology, um, you know, random company X, you're a small dental clinic, what people are motivated by is cold hard cash. And they, they want to make money, they want to get your data, they want to make money, or they want to wreak havoc, as I'm sure some of us used to do when we were younger. And so, even if it's a nation state attack, there are levels to it. Not everyone is this super advanced, you know, pro-criminal wearing the dark hoodie and the sunglasses, you know, furiously typing, they're going through three keyboards a day, right? Um, you know, oftentimes it's just regular people who are just kind of running scans and they have an Nmap script and then they're, you know, seeing if you have open ports or, if, you know, uh, they, you, they can launch an SMB exploit or something and, and that's it, right? And so whether you're an enterprise or a small company, if you're unprepared, you're gonna be targeted. I don't know if you can see this too well. Um, this is from the DBIR. This is a huge report. I don't have time to go through everything. It's broken down by uh, industry and really detailed report. If you haven't uh, seen it before, I really highly recommend it. It's a great resource. But the point of this slide is that, you know, what, what are risks? And, and the answer is all the things. You know, you have hacking, people uh, improperly disposing of things, people publishing things they don't, don't really need to be publishing, if you remember Sony, for example, um, with their private key. Um, you know, malware, theft, phishing, everything, right? People, uh, internal actors, and so it's, it's a wide array of things. So I'd, if you look at per industry, oh, let's use healthcare as an example, you can dig deeper and you can say, okay, well, m half or more of the risks you face are internal threats where people don't know what they're doing, they're making mistakes, uh, they don't have you know, a process that guides them through it, and so they send patient health information to the wrong person, or uh, they upload patient files to uh, you know, an open to the public internet FTP server. But the threats are, it's everything. 
because healthcare is sort of my world, um, I think it's always useful to, uh, to look at the Office for Civil Rights data. And so the High Tech Act passed in 2019, uh, they say that if you have a data breach, you're a healthcare company, right? And the data breach affects 500 or more people, you have to post this data. Uh, you have to report it to them, and then it gets put on this website. And so the, the, if you just Google OCR data breach portal, you, you can find it. And so I, I pulled the data from 2016, January 1st, uh, through yesterday, right? So I think that was June 1st. Uh, and these, these numbers are, are pretty startling. And, and, and so hacking IT incidents accounted for 12,430,601 individuals affected by data breaches in healthcare alone. This is in two years. Right? Unauthorized access, this is, this is a, a person problem, right? It's a training problem, it's a doing the right thing problem. 2,440,556. Theft, almost a million. Losing things, you're just losing things, right? That's uh, 50,087. Improper disposal, 40,000. And so when, when you compare, let's say, improper disposal with hacking in IT, the number is small. But think about it like this. This is nearly 40,000 real people, just like you or I, who go home at the end of every day, and they're focusing on their real problems, they're real people with real struggles, and they just want to get through the day, uh, provide for their families, but because of improper disposal, uh, they get a, a letter in the mail saying, hey, we don't know what happened with your data, you know, we didn't dispose of it properly. The, the truck, the door flew open, and all the papers fell out. And so if you've been around healthcare for a while, you know this happens all the time. One note about this though, this does not include um, the uh, breaches that are actively being investigated, which go back all the way to 2016, which probably adds millions more to this after they're done. And so this number will constantly change, but this doesn't include that. It also doesn't include breaches affecting under 500 people, and it doesn't uh, include the breaches that were never reported. So if you've worked, in healthcare there's this problem where nothing is a data breach because some nuance in the law or some interpretation says, it's not really a data breach. I did a, I did a risk assessment and it's totally cool. Don't worry about it. Um, so I live uh, in the greater Seattle area. Um, geographically, uh, it's, uh, it's in a county called King County. And so you have Seattle on one side um, and then you have, uh, you know, water and then you have Bellevue, which is where Expedia is, Redmond where uh, Microsoft is. A lot of tech companies, everyone's there. Google, Facebook, uh, startups, everyone you can imagine is in King County. There are a lot of people there. And so King County Sheriff's Office uh, is more of the rural areas. They also um, you know, patrol uh, some cities. They do a contract. And so I thought, OK, we always talk about uh, theft and laptops being lost and stolen. So what does that actually look like when uh, you get the data? And so this is, this is one agency, one agency. Um, out of many in a pretty tiny area you can drive all around it in about an hour unless there's traffic which is most of the time if you're from Washington you know this very well they just closed down I-5 by the way really bad um, 997 laptops were stolen almost all of them were car thefts and almost all of them were residential robbers right or, and so if you look at your threat model is stolen laptops in there if it's not, it should be, because the idea that people are just going to keep it safe, don't worry, I have it on my back, it's in my home, it's safe, that's not reality. And you can see by the numbers, these are people calling the police, saying somebody just robbed my home and your laptop is stolen. And now whether it's, you know, advanced nation state attack getting 50,000 patient records, or it's somebody stealing your laptop, these numbers, by the way, include many, many instances where the laptop was just stolen. It, it's still a data breach, and this is real people's uh, data being, being stolen. And so the risks at a glance are everything happens all the time, but there's, there's one thing that, that keeps coming up. Almost all of the threats and risks that you face can be mitigated by having people who are aware, who are trained, and actually have the tools to do the right thing and to, to report phishing emails and to, to get in, uh, in contact with you as soon as their laptop is stolen. There are things you can do, but almost never do people do uh, uh, report it because they're scared of being reprimanded, they don't care, they don't know, who do I report it to, you know, am I gonna lose my job, right? 
And so when you're talking about building a security culture, you're, you're talking about solving for those problems. The DBIR uh, it includes an interesting section of, of phishing emails, and almost all of them go unreported, even when clicked. A tiny, tiny percentage, things like 7%, um, end up reporting it. And those reports, on average, the fastest report is 28 minutes after somebody clicked on something. Right? But more often than not, you know, they report it, okay, nothing really happens, or they don't report it, or they don't know how to report it, and so nothing ever happens. Uh, this is from uh, the 2018 um, Health Information Management System Society at the HIMSS um, Cybersecurity Survey. And so uh, I'm focusing a lot on healthcare. This kind of applies to everyone in some way or another. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like the DBIR for healthcare. And, and so these numbers are interesting because um, in the top left, uh, you know, what, what percentage of uh, your uh, organization's IT budget goes to cybersecurity? Not your organization's budget. Your organization's already small cyber or IT budget, right? Almost all of them are one to to six percent. That's tiny. That's almost nothing. And if you've worked in security for a while, you know that this is nothing. Between the tooling and the people, if you work somewhere, you know, like Seattle or San Francisco, the salaries are just way too high. You know, this means that there are too few people. There are too few resources. There's too little time to actually implement anything. Some do a pretty good job, some don't know, about 15% don't, don't even know. Um, there's no specific thing, which probably means you go to your boss and you say, hey, I need this, and they're like, write a business case, and you're like, you just say, eh, actually, this probably isn't that important. Right? I think we've all been there at one point or another. And then the bottom left, uh, the change of resources, yeah, it's increased. It's increasing every year. If you go back and, and look at the HIM survey for um, 2016 to 2018, it's increasing almost every single year, which should be a great thing, right? But 11% now it's kind of, it's not really increasing. It's sort of staying at the baseline. For some, it's going up, going down a little bit. But when you look at the section on uh, security awareness and training, we're spending more on cybersecurity. We're hiring more people. We're getting really cool tools and all this cool stuff and like zero day advanced protection and you're making under $20 million a year revenue and you're not in healthcare or finance and like you got this really cool tool. Um, but when you look at uh, uh, educating your workforce, um, almost nobody does it daily, weekly, uh, or uh, bi-monthly. Almost everybody does a monthly training or a quarterly training or a biannual training. Some people have no idea. And so mo th this survey is taken by cybersecurity leaders. So people who are leading their organization, they're just like, I don't really know. All right? And so it, it's, it's not a priority, and the frequency is low. And so what happens? Well, let, let's go back. How many of you remember you know, the details of that training that you took three years ago in that portal that looked like it was designed back into the 2000s and you checked the box and you really took it to heart. Now you care about your company's cybersecurity posture. Is there, no? And, and that's the point. And, you know, we're, we're cybersecurity people. We're, we're professionals at this. Um, and even we were just like, eh, whatever, we'll just go with our skills. But that's not the way to do it. Every organization's unique. Every organization has their own things, their own workflows that you need to accommodate for, right? And people just aren't paying attention because it's done just so casually. It's nobody's spending money on it. It's not a hot talking point, you know. Would you rather get more ASAs, which I'd argue maybe you shouldn't use ASAs at all, um, or would you invest in workforce training, which has the biggest bang for the buck? Well, I'd argue based off the data we saw, how almost everything is directly uh, mapped back to people uh, being educated and being able to you know, confide in somebody, hey, this happened, being able to say, yeah, I was compromised, that focusing on workforce education is probably a lot more bang for the buck. It's a lot cheaper, it's easy to do, you can do it with one person. It's very effective. And, and, and this goes to the heart of what we were talking about, is the, the actual program in almost every company uh, checks the box. Um, but it, it's not about doing a training and signing a training saying you, you did it. I've had people in the past, 
finish a HIPAA training, and then hours after they go and they view PHI out of curiosity. One of my headers in the training documents I make is do not view PHI out of curiosity. And so this idea that we're just gonna give people these annual trainings or quarterly trainings and everything's gonna be great, it's ridiculous, it just doesn't work. When you care about something, if any of you are activists about anything, you care because you get this, this feeling in your gut. You, you, it, it's the culture and the attitude of the organization you're supporting or the cause, whether it's you know, um, uh, uh, gender equality or climate change or whatever it is, or maybe in, in cybersecurity you or compliance, you have your own thing. But it's that feeling you get in your gut that you feel like what you're doing matters. That, that you have people that you can coordinate with to actually do the thing. But if you just go and you check boxes and you say, yeah, I did the training, very little ever comes of that. And so let's say you're uh, starting a security education and awareness program or any sort of education awareness program. The first thing I, I, I tell people um, to do if, if you're starting out of nowhere is just do something. Put content out there. Open the floodgates and have volume. One of the things that I like to do is I, I like to send out a, a weekly newsletter or, or something that people will actually read, going through new and current events and uh, applying it to what we're doing. And here's why it's important, and here's what you can do about it. And yes, we're talking about a nation state attack against US-based universities, but the world is not ending. There's something you can do about it, right? You can pay attention to your emails. You can keep things updated. These are tangible things you know how to do that you can do, and I encourage you to do them. Post interesting articles. Go on, uh, you know, if you're, I'm, almost everyone here is probably on Twitter. Um, go, go to a website, Malwarebytes uh, blog, right, and just post things to your dev team, to um, your, uh, to admin assistants, everyone. Go on Slack and just post an article and say, hey, this, 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 this might be relevant to you. This Equifax thing, hey, let's talk a little bit more about this. And also tell, tell stories, you know. Speak up in meetings. Use your own experiences and talk about how is this relevant to you and what are the implications to you? What can you do about it, right? We, 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 we have this tendency almost to, when, when we do things like this, is we just post the facts. You know, most of us are engineers. We think in terms of facts. But most people are not like this. Even a lot of technical people who are outside of security. You need to say, okay, this is bad, but here's what went wrong. Here's what we do that would prevent this. We have two-factor authentication, so if this attack hit us, it would not work. And people respond to that because then they say, now I understand why I have to do this thing every time I log in. Now they're going to advocate for two-factor authentication on Dropbox, even though there's only business information and not patient information there, right? And so get, get content out there. Be creative on, on how you do it. Um, but always follow everything up with this is, this is why it matters, and it's going to be okay because we're already doing things to stop this, and the things you do, they actually make a difference. Probably the most overlooked um, aspect of uh, security uh, awareness training, building a culture of security, is, is we, we think about it in terms of a security program. You have a program charter. Um, and if any of you uh, do project management, uh, it's, it's, it's just this thing and it has objectives and shareholder value in this and we're gonna post the article and then you know all of these great things will happen and the ROI is gonna be great and yeah, everything's awesome. And so to an executive that might sound fine, but in practice, your goal is to protect that data. Those 15 million uh, individuals that had their uh, most sensitive information breached. In healthcare alone, uh, since 2016 to now, you're focused on that. And so you need to make it work. And part of that is realizing that at the end of this conference, at the end of this call, um, you know, I'm gonna go on a flight, just like you all are, and we're gonna get home, and we're gonna see our loved ones, our friends, we're gonna go back to work, we're gonna socialize with the people we usually socialize with, take the bus, we're gonna deal with the struggles, that, that, we, uh, that we all face, and uh, you know, we're gonna be distracted by big events in our lives, 
And so when, when you're communicating to your, your, your team, when you're building out this program, when you're thinking about how to word or message something, you need to think uh, about the fact that things happen. Good things happen, bad things happen, people are distracted, and if you catch them at a bad moment, when they're struggling with something or something really terrible happened to them, you've destroyed your relationship with them. And they're, they're going to just, in one ear, out the other. And so it's absolutely critical, and this is something that's really hard to teach, is, is have empathy and really keep an open mind. Transcend security for a moment. Transcend uh, you know, KPIs and um, deliverables and all that fun stuff, and just think about, like, these are real people that I'm talking to. And yeah, I'm at work right now. I'm supposed to be a professional. It doesn't matter. Think about what a business actually is, right? A business is, in the state of Washington or wherever, I have a document saying that I'm a registered business. But look around in the room when, next time you're in a meeting. It's all just people. Jeff Bezos is just a person who goes home. He likes to make cocktails. I go home, I walk my dog. You know, I like to run. We all have things. And so whether you're a massive enterprise or a small company, we're all just individually people. But when we go to work, we change almost. And, and we, we like to take all emotion out of everything we do. And we like to think of people as resources, whether uh, it's intentional or not. If you do that, when you're trying to teach them something, when, when you're trying to uh, you know, teach against their better instincts, when you want them to do something really uncomfortable, like report that they got owned, they're not going to do it. And so you need to consider this. The Las Vegas shooting. After that happened, I didn't post anything for about a, a month and a half. People were affected by that. And I don't know uh, exactly who. I know some people were. I don't know how, you know, people that were indirectly affected. But you have to consider this. You can't just go on, on regular schedule and say, okay, I'm going to post all of this great content. And uh, we're going to talk about two-factor authentication after, uh, you know, somebody may have lost somebody uh, or one of their family members or friends. The Boston Marathon bombing, same thing. And I can list event after event. And now we're more connected than ever that everyone feels the impact of, of these things that happen. And so you need to be unusually aware of these things and adjust what you're doing to that. And also give people a purpose. And this goes back to if you're an uh, you know, activist for something. You, you, you want people to feel like their contribution actually matters. So if you talk about politics, why do people not vote? Well, it's because my vote doesn't matter. OK, but it, it really does matter. So now how do you uh, convince somebody that it does? Right? You don't want them to feel that way. When they get to that point uh, where they feel like, oh, my vote doesn't matter. I'm just one person out of 200 people in my company. OK, well, then they're just not going to do anything. They're just going to uh, they're, they're stop uh, reading the things you put out. They're going to stop reporting things. They're not going to uh, secure their laptops. They're not going to take the threats seriously. So they're not going to try to mitigate against them. They'll leave their uh, laptops in their cars. right? They'll you know, leave their laptops out at Starbucks. And so what they don't see is what actually happens. So show them videos of that incident in Starbucks where two people were, were just having coffee right there with their computer. Somebody went out and snatched it. Show them videos of dump trucks filled with all of this stuff that needs to be shredded, confidential information opening. Show them a video of uh, zero days actually being used at Black Hat or DEF CON and show them, hey, like that, you're owned. Right? They need to see it, and then you need to tell them, here are the things that you can do to, to, to mitigate uh, against these threats. And you can actually do it, right? But be very, very conscious of the fact that they're real people. You don't know what they're going through. Next thing is, is you need to make everything simple. And so uh, outside of the security team, whether it's developers or it's administrative assistants or it's an executive, how do you know somebody knows what phishing is? You know what phishing is. I've known what phishing is for the past you know, two, three decades. OK, well, people probably don't. I got asked recently, I made this mistake, um, what's phishing? I just said, OK, I'm going to talk about phishing. Well, that didn't work. Half the people didn't know what phishing actually was. So don't make assumptions. Spell everything out for them. Make it accessible as possible. So when you're talking about phishing, what is phishing? How does that look like? 
structure your content around this idea that people want to know, but the only way for them to know is to start at the very beginning. Just because you know, you're 10, 20, 30 years into your career doesn't mean anybody's even started. And a lot of devs don't have a, a security uh, background. They don't necessarily know what SQL injection is. Should they? Yeah. OK. Well, what's your solution? Should have known about SQL injection. OK, how's that going to work? They're just going to go and they're going to learn about SQL injection, and they're going to start incorporating secure development practices? Absolutely not. I'm going to say, well, this guy's kind of an ass. Tell me to go learn SQL injection. This is important. Did you see our, our uh, risk registry? It's, a, it's a high, or very high. Impact's very high. OK, well, is that really a strategy? How about you just have a conversation with them and say, hey, cool, I did this really cool thing. Do you want to see me actually do a SQL injection? And then they see it, and they go out and they take a class about it. This has happened to me before. Give them resources to learn. Say, you know, hey, this you know, person on YouTube, this is really cool stuff. Let's do a demonstration. Show them like, how you actually look for these vulnerabilities in your network. Just bring somebody along and say, you know, hey, you want to see something really cool? Because at the end of the day, we're just people. And we do uh, you know, separate into silos. But ultimately, we do want to be part of something bigger than us. But we need a way in. Have any of you ever done a, a ride along with a police department once? Uh, how, have you ever shadowed a, a physician in a hospital or clinic? Um, have, you ever, have you ever been an intern? No interns? Um, have you ever done anything where you feel like you really want to uh, do something, or you're in a high pressure situation with somebody you don't know, and they tell you to do something, and you try to do it, and you just fumble? I think everyone's sort of been in that position. That's how people feel when they're interacting with you. You're the security team, right? You're the technical guys. You do this black magic wizardry, and you, know, you have a hoodie on, and your sunglasses, and you have 10 monitors up, and like, you're, you're not even using a, an Intel i7. You're using an i15. <laughs> you know, that's what people are thinking about, though. It's true. It really is. You know, they don't know this stuff at all. And you, give, you have to give them the opening and explicitly tell them, this is what you do. And when you give them those uh, instructions, you have to. You absolutely have to make it as simple as possible. Don't assume anything. When you think, if you have to think if it's simple enough, it's not simple enough. And use verbiage that uh, they can use. So for example, in the keynote speak, there was you know, kind of a, you know, a little thing of the word cyber, cybersecurity. Do I like the word? Nah, probably not all the time. But that's what people use. And so when I'm training my team, or I'm training an executive that is definitely vulnerable to a whole host of things. And if they're owned, really bad things will happen. When they go to a conference and they uh, hear about cybersecurity, they need to, the, the, the skills they have are going to enhance that experience. And for that to happen, they need to know what everyone else is talking about. So in healthcare, I need to know that, um, you know, uh, hospital CISOs are going out and using this verbiage, so I'm going to incorporate that into my program. Keep that in mind. You know, what are they being exposed to? What do I want them to see and hear? And what words are they using? And then copy those words so it's familiar to them. It's not perfect. It's not the ideal solution. But it's also not ideal to have 15 million patients between 2016 and yesterday have their PHI, patient health information, breached because of, of things that could have been completely avoided by having one person doing this um, you know, two, three, four hours a week. Spell everything out. Um, again, people approach this almost like they're infants, not in a bad way, but they don't know what to do. You have to tell them, when you get a phishing email, send it to here. Here's a document. Here's where you can find it. Send it to here. When I tell people, you know, if something happens, you, you lose your laptop, in all of my trainings and all of my talks, I tell them the same thing. If it's 3 a.m. and I'm in PTO and I'm in a foreign country, call me, text me, you know, do whatever you need to do to make sure that I have eyes on it and it is okay. I will take care of it and you're not going to get in trouble for it. 
you need to spell it out for people. Because even if they know, even if you're a seasoned pro, just because you know something doesn't mean you feel something. And you need to get them to feel the, the camaraderie and, 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 and to, to, to build this muscle memory where they're just sending everything to you. And so in an ideal world, people are sending you these things all the time. But they will only ever do it if you spell it out for them. You have to spell it out word for word. This is how you do it for every simple thing. And so if you ask most people in an organization, how do you report phishing? When should you report phishing? What is phishing? Nine out of 10 times, I don't know, IT handles it. Okay, is that an effective strategy? Uh, probably not. What, what is more effective that? You have a place where people can report it, they know how to report it, and they actually report it, right? And so then you can act on it. And the last thing is, you know, tell people it's not their fault. You know, it's, you know, we, we've created this culture where it's almost like if you do these things, it's a bad thing, and so now you're a bad person. But the reality is, again, their experience is complicated. They're doing things other than what you do full time. And because they exported the wrong things, stored it on their computer, doesn't mean that they're bad or they're a bad person and they should be penalized. Problem is, your system sucks. And you, you didn't create a solution that would prevent them from doing that. If they click on the link, well, yeah, well, you go into this job knowing they're going to click on the link. And so are we going to get angry at them and tell them of uh, what you did was really bad and um, you know, it's completely your fault, but don't worry, we can fix you? That's the conversation that's happening across most organizations today, and it doesn't work. We've seen it hasn't worked for, you know, since the internet was, was invented. It just doesn't work, right? And so if, if I go to any one of you and I say, um, you know, one of your talks, if any of you guys are, are speakers, and I come up to you and, and I just say, well, your talk was kind of sucky and uh, everything you know is wrong, but don't worry, we'll help you through it. You're not going to think of me as a nice guy who wants to help you, right? That is not going to happen. The exact opposite will happen. So why is that different for anything else in life, right? So spell everything out. You need a reprimand policy that works. So show of hands again, who's worked in a healthcare environment in some capacity or another? So you, you all may know that there is in HIPAA a sanctions policy. It's codified into law. It was passed by Congress. You need to have one. Have a policy that is sane and makes sense. What do you get as a business or as a cybersecurity team when somebody reports they clicked on a link and then they're possibly terminated? You need to do away with the archaic uh, uh, reprimand policies that say everything you do is bad. Here's the right thing to do. If you do that thing, you're probably going to lose your job or there's a, something on your record you're never going to be promoted. How is that going to work? You know what the result is? Well, the result is probably, I would guess, that they're not going to report anything to you. And the DBIR, I, I'd encourage you all to go see the full report, the section on uh, reporting phishing. You see exactly that. And so fear doesn't work. It has never worked. When people get scared, they pull back or they fight back. And so either uh, you make an adversary or you get somebody who's never going to be pre present, won't listen to what you're doing, and they, they won't ever have that feeling like, yes, what I'm doing is important. And then business buy-in. Uh, we're running short on time, so I'll kind of cruise through this. Uh, do it at a small scale. Post articles. Get some data points on what works, what doesn't. This is a process that, you, you, that develops over time. You're not going to get it right the first time. Find out what your cadence can be, how long it takes you to put this stuff together, what's your time investment, and then use resources like the DBIR and the other resources I had in the slide to sort of get some data as to you know, what are the threats and what does it look like and can this program mitigate them. Whenever you're going to a manager or an executive, I know because I live in this world, this is all I do, you need a proposal in hand. Don't wait for permission to get something started. If you have one or two hours, that's more than enough to write a, just a simple bare bones proposal. Put it on paper. Have answers for people. You know, it's effective, it's low cost. 
You want to highlight the benefits that people are going to burn out less, they're going to care more, they're going to make fewer mistakes, they're going to, you know, we're going to increase uh, interdepartmental engagement and all that fun stuff. Leverage your mission and values, especially in the C-suite. Uh, senior management, people love talking about their mission and values. I say this kind of blandly because to a point it is people just want to hear what they want to hear. Use that to your advantage to do what really matters. And so tie everything back into your mission and values. Make it the forefront of everything you do. And then bring it all back to the bottom line. How's this going to help us? About 60% of the threats that we face can be solved by this to some extent or another, or mitigated. Um, and it's going to affect our bottom line in this way. Average cost of a breach is this. We could probably decrease it by this. Not everything needs a bona fide source. Sometimes you can say, well, I guess it's about 30%. This is a proposal. You just want to get your foot in the door. And so as uh, somebody in the C-suite, I see that. I'm like, okay, cool, we can run with this. But if, if, if you make somebody who's already doing a billion things have to stop and ask you too many questions, they don't get it, it's never going to happen. So come with a proposal in hand. I strongly encourage you at least try it. Be persistent, and if it doesn't work the first time, keep trying. And if that doesn't work, you really care about this, you want to get better at it, you want to improve your security, do it anyway. Send out articles. What's your manager going to do? Don't talk about cybersecurity in the meeting, right? So just do it. If you care about it enough, you will find a way. And so I don't really have time to, to talk about this. I'm, you know, I have probably a minute left. Um, but essentially what happened was we had a massive vendor, Fortune 100 company, has something to do with sales. Um, and our representative for this undisclosed sales organization that may or may not have a cloud as a logo, uh, our rep sends us uh, an email. Uh, one of our, uh, it was our Salesforce manager who clicked on it. She realized right away something was horribly wrong. Within one to two minutes, everyone was on Slack going crazy, calling me, texting me. Um, you know, I'm walking down the street. This is what Seattle looks like most of the time. There's construction. This is, this is going uh, towards Amazon, the sea of blue, because everyone has the blue badges. And I was, I was right here when my colleague, Brian, he's uh, one of the devs, he gets a message on his Slack because everything's on silent. I'm getting lunch, man. I'm going to eat. Um, and he tells me this is happening. And so within one minute, we had a report. I was able to run up the hill, and uh, we, we got it contained. No patient data was breached. If we didn't have everything I just talked about, if they didn't trust me, if they didn't have the tools to, to know where to report and how, we would have been in a lot of shit but we weren't. And so that's the presentation. Thank you all.